Hey, good morning. Pastor Brad here. It's another hot day. It's summer, and we're glad to be together again around God's Word. It's good to meet with you. Thank you for joining with us again today. You know, all of us, right, every week we're, we're having to figure out, can we afford this? Can we afford that? We're always looking at costs, budgets. Uh, can I afford to buy this? A car, a house, something much smaller. Does it fit into our budget? Is it priority? Investment, time and investment. Can I afford to invest into, uh, into this area of uh, ministry or invest in somebody's life? The commitments that we make in life, marriage, relationships, uh, projects, whatever it might be. You know, we're always weighing just the different investments, different costs, different priorities, different obligations that we make. And we ask ourselves the question, is it, is it worth it? What's, what's, the cost of, uh, what's the cost of this connection gonna be? What's the cost of this investment gonna be? What's the cost of this thing that I buy? Can I afford it? What's the cost gonna be back into our budget, into our lifestyle, into, uh, into my walk with the Lord? All those kind of things. We're just always assessing those things. This morning we're in John chapter 19. We're in verses one through 16. And we're looking consistently as John reveals the relationship of Christ with his disciples, of Christ to the world. We see Christ now having left the upper room, having left the Garden of Gethsemane, now going, uh, being interrogated, uh, going through trials that are illegal, being, being uh, beaten, all kind of things that we're gonna see here. He's moving towards the cross. He has one mission, he has one goal, he's made an investment, he's made a commitment from eternity past. I am gonna love humanity. I'm gonna love the inhabitants of this world with my very life. What's the cost to our Savior? What was the cost that he paid? We can't possibly take a comprehensive look at, at the full cost in one sermon as to what Jesus was willing to pay so that you and I might have a relationship with his Father and with him through the Holy Spirit. But this morning we're going to receive elements of that, significant elements that just speak to our life. So we're in John 19, verses 1 through 16. Let's, let's look at these pieces. What is the cost? What was the cost to Jesus as he took our place on the cross? Let's begin in chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus, and he flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, and put it on his head, and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. This is just a brief glimpse into what we see take place under the ministry of Christ, under his commitment to go to the cross. The cost that he paid initially here in this text was simply this. Jesus Christ was absolutely brutalized. He was, he was beaten to a pulp. He was punished inappropriately in every way. It was wicked. It was evil. The worst of it is such that we can't even put it into words. We can't even hardly fathom what it was he walked through. But as we look at the totality of Scripture, we just understand that, that all that takes place in these three verses and in the Gospels together was prophesied. It was a part of the plan of God. Isaiah 53 speaks to, the, to this punishment, that he, the treatment that he will receive. Matthew chapter 20, as Jesus is going to Jerusalem with his disciples, he prophesies that this very thing is going to take place. The Son of Man is going to be condemned, delivered over, mocked, flogged, crucified. Matthew 27 verse 30 adds that he'll be spit upon. We have these elements of, of uh, interrogation that are used. We have these elements of punishment that are used against him. He is flogged. There are three levels of flogging that take place. Someone just to kind of a, a light warning. Those who really deserve it and then those who are going to be crucified or executed receive a, a more severe punishment from Rome. These punishments weren't, weren't to be given to Roman citizens. They were for non-Roman citizens, for slaves, for, for criminals. And, and we see the, 
the, the, the, it says he was flogged here, he was scourged here. That is really a, a punishment that is beyond words and it's beyond description. Uh, the, the tools that were used to implement this punishment were, were evil in every way. Uh, they were whip cords, leather cords. They were used with, with bits of bone and, and metal and rock in them. And, and the person who was being whipped would, would have to lay horizontal, be tied. His back would be laid bare. This is what happened to Jesus. They would whip. Not When, when Paul was whipped in the New Testament, they, they didn't whip over 40 times to preserve life. There was no such limitation when Romans applied this punishment. There were many who were, who were given this punishment who simply were and were and were had a sentence of execution who never made it to execution because they died here in this punishment. This is what Jesus received. The muscles would be rendered open. The, the bones would even be uh, rendered open. His back would be split. I'm not going to say any more than that. I've, I've listened to sermons who have come from a medical perspective and, and explained the excruciating pain that Jesus Christ went through. It's terrible. It's beyond words. And what Jesus went through here was, was beyond words. His back was split open as they scourged him and, and flogged him and, and, and whipped him as an innocent man, as an innocent Savior. They, they forced a crown of thorns upon his head beyond description. And what's interesting here as you think about it, those thorns were, were pressed upon his head to mock his royalty, to mock Israel, to put in front of them, this is your king, to mock Jesus, his claim to be king, to be son of God, to be that. But more than that, we think about Genesis when Adam and Eve fell. Genesis 3 reminds us that when he fell, God said to Adam, because of your sin, the ground is going to be cursed and thorns and thistles are going to come up from the ground. It's an interesting perspective to understand that when, when these uh, thorns, the crown of thorns was thrust upon his head, he was, he was wearing the very curse that was placed upon mankind because of our sin. We sinned and, and the earth was cursed. We sinned and mankind was cursed. And here is, here is Jesus taking our sin upon himself. Here is Jesus wearing that curse upon his brow. Jesus identified with our sin, took our sin upon him in every way. That's the picture that we get here. And when we consider that and then consider the heart and the soul of Jesus Christ, we have to remember, we've emphasized this the last three weeks, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. From that garden, he prays. From that garden, he, he challenges the disciples to pray. He says, your flesh is, is weak. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. He says, you need to watch and you need to pray. And the result of that was that Jesus watched and Jesus prayed. And he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And he was willing. He who had a willing spirit before his Father to accomplish the will of the Father and the will of from, that they had decided upon from eternity past. And he, he stayed the course. Jesus willingly took our punishment. He took our place on the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 reminds us that, that we were enemies before any of us ever met Jesus Christ, received Jesus Christ as Savior. We were described as being an enemy of our Heavenly Father. We deserved punishment and wrath only. We deserved no grace, no mercy. You and I deserve none of that, no love. And yet Jesus put himself out there in our place to take the wrath of God and to love us unconditionally, to give us the means to have a relationship with the Father. In fact, John tells us there's no greater love than what Jesus did, than someone lays down his life for his friend. In fact, when we become a child of God, we are then called the friends of God. We're called sons and daughters of God. We're called a member of the family of God. We go from being enemies to sonship. We go from being enemies to being a, a child of God, being a friend of God. What a beautiful thing. This description here, they put a robe, they put a, a robe on him, a purple, reddish robe, to mock him again as to his, his royalty, to mock Israel, here's your king. It is all done in... in, in Ridicule and with a spirit of mocking him. It is, a, it is a terrible thing of just humiliation. Everything about this is humiliation. Everything about this is, is exposing Jesus Christ. And the Jews desired this more than anything else. The leaders, the leaders of Israel here 
in this text more than anything else, didn't want him stoned to death by the Old Testament standard, Jewish standard. They wanted him executed by crucifixion by the Roman standard to humiliate him in every way. That's exactly what's taking place. Jesus is rejected. Let's look at verse 4. And so Pilate went out again, and he said to them, he says this to the Jews, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and, Ju and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again, and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. And so Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. And everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And so when, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat, the Bema seat, at a place called the Stone Pavement, and an Aramaic Gabbatha. We see here in these verses that Jesus is rejected. He is rejected. Pilate brought him out to the Jewish leaders. He brought him out. He has a, thorn, a crown of thorns on his head. He is bleeding profusely from his head, his back, weak. He's brought out. Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. Three times he says this in chapter 28 at the end, two times here in chapter 19, these verses. So he brings him out. He says he's not guilty. By doing that, he's conveying, I'm not going to have him executed. It's up to you Jews to take care of to take care of matters. It's up to you to do that. Verse 6, they said, no, crucify him. Verse 6, they said, crucify him. They said, crucify him. This was their decision. They weren't going to let it get by. Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. Verse 7, they said, he has violated our law and is worthy of death according to our law. He has made himself to be the Son of God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. That's what it's all about. Blasphemy. And so Pilate goes back in to his home. Jesus is there. And he says, where are you from? Pilate is, is terrified because Rome and, and Greece worshipped pagan deities. They And that belief system was that those deities could could uh, become a man, take on the form of a man. He's terrified that who he's dealing with here may be a god. From his perspective, most terrifying in every way. Jesus wouldn't respond. Jesus wouldn't respond. Pilate has a dilemma here. I want us to look at that. I want us to see Pilate's dilemma, okay? First thing we see this is that uh, Pilate declares him guiltless. He's come to that conclusion. He meets with him. He interrogates him. He's done nothing worthy of a death sentence. He sends him to Herod. He tries to get rid of the problem. It is said by the Jews, well, he has stirred up Galilee. Oh, Galilee, that's not my jurisdiction. That's Herod's. Well, Herod happens to be in town. He sends him to Herod. Herod interrogates him. He's beaten there. But he's not guilty, not of death. He sends him back to Pilate. Pilate can't get rid of him. He offers Barabbas as a substitute, one who revolted against Rome, who tried to spur an insurrection against Rome, who tried to overthrow Rome. Certainly, Pilate thinks they're not going to take Barabbas. He's violent, a murderer. They take Barabbas. 
He's approached by his wife while he's on the judgment seat. He's approached by his wife. I've had terrible dreams on account of Jesus. You must not have anything to do with him. Well, that's scary. How do you listen to your wife? She's being affected out here because of what's happening to Jesus. He has Jesus punished. I think the reason that he does that is to show his authority over Jesus. But more than that, to show himself strong, but more than that, to create sympathy among the Jewish leaders, to look at him and say, well, this certainly isn't our king. This man's not a threat. This man's not worthy of death. It's, it's a way of, of Pilate seeking to manipulate the crowd, the emotions of the crowd, to have, to have mercy on this man who's been beaten. Who's so, what did he do? He's not worthy of death. Surely he should not be executed. He attempts to release him multiple times, we're told here in verse 12. He has a potential God on his hands. He can't handle that because if it is a God, and all those things are true, then Pilate's great fear is that the gods are going are to wreck vengeance on him because of this stuff. He has authority. He has authority over Jesus from his perspective, but he doesn't have the will of conviction to follow through to release him. Remember, he has said he's innocent. He's not guilty. Three times he said that. He's threatened with his relationship regarding Caesar. Verse 12, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. He's had many troubles with Caesar. He's on the cusp, but if another problem comes up from the people of Israel, Pilate may lose his position and he may lose his life. You don't cross Caesar. He fears a riot, a potential uprising. We see that in Matthew 27. Matthew 27, he declares his own innocence. He declares his own innocence. Here we see Matthew 27, 24. The fear hears the crowds. He thought they were beginning to riot. He was gaining nothing. Rather, a riot was forming. And so he takes water. He washes his hands before the crowds. And he says, I am, I am innocent of this man's blood. How interesting that three times he declared the innocence of our Lord. He's so much like us. Folks, we're so much like him. We, are, we encounter the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word. It touches our heart. It pricks our heart. It pricks our conscience. We can't sleep. That's all we can think about is how, how it's touched our lives and it convicts us. And yet we push back because the cost, the cost of responding to the truth, we come to the determination that the cost is too high. It's too high to submit and yield to the truth. It's too, it's too costly to view ourselves as God views ourselves, to see ourselves as sinners. It's too costly to give up what we enjoy in this world. It's, it's, it's not worth it. I'm not willing to take that cross. I'm not willing to change. Peter, I mean, Pilate here believes that Jesus is innocent, but he's not willing to give up his throne for that. He's not willing to have a riot happen because of that. He's not willing to, to face the trouble that it's going to bring him if he takes that stand. What we see here is our Lord is innocent. He's rebuked, and yet he's innocent. Isaiah 59, 3 reminds us that his grave was made with the, with the wicked. He had done no violence, and no deceit was in his mouth. He is like a lamb without spot or blemish, we are told in 1 Peter 1, 19. We're told he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth, Peter tells us. This is our Savior. This is Jesus Christ. This is who is being executed. Hebrews 7.26 beautifully portrays the character of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was holy and He was innocent. He is. And He's unstained. He's separate, separated from sinners. His holiness in every way separates Him from the sinners, even the disciples. Anyone who is born of a man, of a woman, is a sinner. He is separate and yet He's exalted above the heavens. He willingly took our guilt upon Himself. Isaiah 53, beautiful passage of the... Just horrific passage, and yet beautiful in prophecy, describing the, the crucifixion of our Lord. He was pierced for our transgressions, our rebellion, our willful rebellion against God. He was crushed for our iniquities. He's crushed for our sins. He's crushed for the things that we do because of our our sin nature. The punishment that we deserved, it was put on Him here. 
the very punishment we deserve turned into peace through Jesus Christ, a relationship of peace through Christ. We found healing because of the wounds of our Savior. When we run to the cross, we experience healing, and we experience peace with God for the first time, and the peace of God in our life. And the Lord has laid on Jesus Christ, He laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us are guilty. No one can look at our life and declare us innocent. We cannot look at our own life as Judas did and wash our hands and, and before God say, I'm innocent of sin and guilt. We're all guilty. We're all stained. We're all totally depraved. We're all unworthy of heaven. Isaiah 53, verse 7, He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so He opened not His mouth mouth. He willingly humbled himself on our behalf. That's what he did. Philippians 2.8 And being found in human form, he humbled himself. How? By in obedience, by going to the cross, by giving his life, by the death of the crucifixion of the cross. He is rejected in every way. He is brutalized. He is rejected. Pilate's terrified, but he's not willing to take the step of releasing Jesus Christ. Jesus reminds Pilate, Pilate, what an opportunity he has to hear the gospel, the grace, to see the Jesus Christ in the flesh, and yet his heart remains cold. Pilate is told, you have no authority. Jesus conveys in that statement the, the assurance if he could, he could bring this to an end right now. His angels could be sent by the Father and release him right now. And so Pilate sets himself down on the judgment seat when he doesn't realize that one day he will stand before the judgment seat and before this very person that he brought to execution, he will now stand before him. What a terrible thing. But Jesus says this in verse 11, You would have no authority over me unless it's been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Who was, it, who was that he was speaking about? Was it a Judas? Well, Judas delivered him over to the Jews. Yes, he did. He betrayed him. He has an accountability and a guilt that is unique to him. But more than that, Caiaphas, the high priest, who knew the Scriptures, who upheld the Scriptures before the people, who led the people spiritually, who should have led the people in embracing the Messiah who is in their very presence, who should have led the people in spiritual revival, is the one who turns him over to Rome to be executed. I believe this is Caiaphas right here who has that greater guilt, and, and, Ju and Judas too. And then finally we culminate with what takes place. And now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. Preparing for the Passover, which is the next day. And so he needs to be executed before the Sabbath, before Passover. And it was about the sixth hour. And so there'll be this, this is, he's going to be executed on Friday, and there's going to be the Sabbath, and then there's going to be the Passover. Two Sabbaths back to back because of the Passover. And so there's, there's a time of preparation here. And it was about the sixth hour. Now, there's, there's, real, there's real debate on this sixth hour, okay? John, John uses the sixth hour. If you're using ESV, which I am, your notes say it's noon. I don't agree with that. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke indicate clearly that Jesus was crucified at 9 o'clock. The third hour is, is the terminology used. It's Jewish time. The day started for the Jews at, at 6 a.m or at sun, sunrise, which isn't exactly 6 a.m., depends on the day. The Romans used a time frame to begin at midnight like our time. And so some say John's using the Roman time. It's not an exact argument. Others say, well, the number six isn't in the, in the original manuscript. The number three should be there. There's two symbols that have only one line difference. So there's answers, potential answers, but none of them that are with cl that are clear as to which option is absolutely the best. The totality of the scriptures give us this: that Jesus Christ was was executed at, at nine o'clock. If we take this to be Roman time, it would be six o'clock in the morning, and there would be a three-hour gap. So there's some questions in here as to John's use of the of the word sixth, um, but it's it's handled in the other gospels clearly and well. And I think there's some good answers to that. It, moving on, we just simply say this. So it was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Your king is your king. Of course, 
they adamantly said, he's not our king. He's not the son of God. He's now mocking them. He's mocking Israel. He's mocking the Jewish leaders. Behold your king. And they cried, away with him, away with him. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? He is mocking them. He is angry at them. They have forced him into a corner. He knows that Jesus is innocent of death. The Jewish leaders are forcing him to ex execute him. All they got to do is send a letter to Rome. There were riots. There were almost riots. He stood for one who, who placed himself as a king against Caesar. He's going to lose his position. They're forcing the hand of Pilate under the sovereignty of God. And so he ridicules them by mocking them, says, this is your king. And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. We have no king but Caesar. What an anathema to, to, a, to a Jewish person here, to, to a member of Israel. Their king is, is God only. Their king, ultimately, the king of kings is standing before them is Jesus Christ. We have no king but Caesar. They hate, they hate Rome and they hate Caesar with a passion. But because of their sin, it's interesting how sin does this to us, doesn't it? When we will not let go of our sin, when we, will, when we stand in unbelief, when we stand and say, I know better than God, it always forces us to go against what we think are our morals. It stands us to even stand against ourself. Israel is now standing against, against their greatest passion. It is Rome. They hate Rome. If there's anyone, they, they don't hate anyone more than Rome. Now they hate Jesus Christ more than Rome, and they deny their very commitment to God himself by saying, Caesar is over us, not God. It's, a, it's amazing what sin does to us. Jesus is condemned here. The cost of relationship for Jesus Christ, finally, is he is condemned. He gives us life. He willingly gave himself up for us. Mark chapter 10, even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be served. How did he do that? The greatest expression of that, he gave up his life as a ransom. That's what he did. How do we know he loved us? He gave up his life for us. That's what he did. The result of that is, he, is salvation. He saves us completely. The work he did on the cross one time brings salvation to everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Those who draw near to God through Christ who draw near into relationship that continues forever. And He lives to make intercession. He lives on it for our behalf. He lives to represent us to the Father. He is our mediator, our advocate, our Savior. He Himself bore our sins on the tree, on His body, His own body, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There is a death that takes place when we're saved. The bondage of sin is, is broken. Not the influence of sin, the bondage of sin. We're no longer under the bondage of sin. And the power of the Word through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and the character of Christ infused into our life, we have the ability to live in victory, to say no to sin, to conform our lives to the image of Christ, to be like Christ. We are healed. We are healed by the wounds that Jesus Christ did for us. Chapter 19, verse 17, reminds us, you have a choice this morning. We have a choice. The Jewish leader says about Jesus, He has made Himself to be the Son of God. He was the Son of God. He fulfilled all Scripture. They rejected that. In unbelief, they said, we will not. Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. He he gave them a, a clear-cut choice. You must believe in me. And they said, we will not. The very purpose of the Gospel of John is found in chapter 20, verse 31. We've looked at this over and over again as we've gone through John. All these things, all these words are written so that we might believe, so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that by believing through faith, you might have life in His name. That by believing, you might have life in His name. That is so key. John says, it reminds all of us this morning, we need faith in Christ. We need faith in Christ. Jesus willingly went to the cross because He loved us. He endured, He counted the cost, and found it worthy of His Father. He found it worthy of love for us. And He paid that 
willingly for us. He calls us as well to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves, to not live with pride, but to live for the sake of Jesus Christ, to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow after Him. He calls us to, to live the same way, to accept the cost of following Jesus Christ, to accept the trials and the tribulations of walking in Jesus Christ, to accept the investment that is required to, to bring the Word of God in relationship to other people, to bring the grace of God in relationship to other people, to show the love of God through our lives to other people. He says to us we are to accept that cost. It may be a small cost, tiny, wearing a mask. This virus is affecting every one of us. You know that? We've got to wear the mask now. Our governor spoke one day. Now it's required to wear masks in the services. He's challenging us to be careful. Whatever you think about all this, we are called to be careful. What good advice. We're called to consider one another. We're called to wear the masks, even as we worship. I don't enjoy that. I don't like that. But you know what? What a small thing to pay to be together, to draw strength together in the body of Christ, to stand together and say, I am a child of God, and I will come together to worship. If you're uncomfortable coming to join us because of the virus, I understand that. We understand that. But Jesus has called us, whatever that cost may be, whatever the investment may be in each other's lives, you know what? Anything that we can possibly do that, is a, that we might consider, consider a hardship or something that we would choose not to do, it is all worth it for the sake of Jesus Christ. Because it was worth it to receive the free gift of salvation, wasn't it? The grace of God in, in your life, the transformation in your life, isn't it worth it? Wasn't it worth it? Is there not an eternal gratitude in your heart and in your life for what Jesus has done for you? It started here. He went to the cross for you. Do you know how much He loves you? He just says to you and I in return, love me with that same kind of love. Be willing to do whatever I ask you, whatever that might be. Lay it down before me. Be all in. Be all in. We are, we are His children. And what a privilege that is. We are blessed beyond words to be a child of God. We are blessed to be a body of Christ. We are blessed to have a witness to share with the world who needs Christ. We are blessed beyond measure. Never forget the blessings you have in Christ. Take those blessings and use them as resources, spiritual resource and enablement in your life so that you might serve the Lord well, so that you might be willing to, to pay whatever cost it is to invest Jesus Christ into the lives of others. Learn from Him that we might be like Him. Lord, our prayer is that You would touch our hearts with these very words, these very thoughts. We need Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. We'll see you next week.